God's peace be with all of you. We arrived to Edmonton and the weather was 30 below. And I told my wife, it's too cold, the plane is still here, maybe we should just go back. And today I am reminded of the Church of Philadelphia. It was a good church with a good reputation. Uh, they loved one another and this church reminds me of the Church of Philadelphia. We missed you, we missed everyone and you were always in our prayers and our thoughts. The trip was very nice. And we learned that there is a plan that man puts together, but there is a plan that God has for us. And God's plan is the one that works. So we visited many people in different countries. We wanted to see relatives and, and friends. And when we were in Kuwait, people from Jordan called us and said, you can't be in the Middle East and not stop in Jordan. We have not seen you for a long time and we're all getting older. So after 35 years being away from Jordan, we decided to go and stop for a visit and it changed so much. Jordan changed. We could not believe this is the same country. And we understood that God is calling us to go to Jordan. And we met many people that were very thirsty, spiritually thirsty for God's word. And we found out that the visit was not a normal visit. We would sit way past midnight and talk about God and His Word and all the treasures of the Bible and how it is important to read God's Word because many churches do not teach that you have to listen to God's word and you have to read God's word. And also I had the pleasure of meeting with Brother Mason and his church was a beautiful church and it was a very warm place they love the Lord, they are very serious about uh, their worship and about their service. It was like a hot coal that is burning. And he sends his greetings to everyone here and he thinks of us often here in Canada. And he sends his uh, warm regards. And uh, one of the things that happened on our trip, which was uh, very interesting, is that we met with a German tourist. This was by the Jordan River. And he put on a swimsuit and a gown. And he went down to the Jordan River. And the water was very cold because it's winter and the tour leader was there and he asked the tour leader how many times should I dunk to be to baptize myself and the tour leader said probably three times that's what I understand and the tourist did that three times and came out and he was cursing because of how cold the water was. And uh, it made me wonder, why did you want to go and uh, do this 
uh, symbol of baptism when you're going to get up and curse. And uh, it reminds me that he went in a dry sinner and came out a wet sinner. Then I ran into him later in a shop and I explained to him all about baptism because he did not know what baptism was. Now, tonight we are going to talk about the marriage at Cana and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I found out in Jordan that many people are divorced. There are probably thousands of them that have broken marriages. And it sounds like or seemed like the church is allowing that. And the reason there are so many broken marriages is because people don't understand what a marriage is. They don't understand the holiness of a marriage. We have a beautiful word from God and we see that in Ephesians. In Ephesians 5, the Lord is in every verse. The Apostle Paul says, Wives, submit your husbands to your husbands as to the Lord. Lo and husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. The husband is the head of the church, his body. The church submits to Christ. This is a profound mystery. Why? Because it is similar to the relationship of Jesus, the Christ, to his church. And that's why we say marriage is a mystery. The mystery in the marriage is that God, who created the world, the whole universe, takes the dust where he created man from to be his bride and to live with him. Now, whenever we read about Jesus' relationship to the believers and the church, we look at the church being the bride of Christ. The importance of this marriage is in the Bible. And we find that the salvation that the Lord has offered us and has done for us comes from uh, the marriage of Hebrew people. We look at three stages where, as far as marriage is concerned. The first thing, the parent chooses a bride for his son or her son. And that's what God the Father shows us as a bride for Christ. When did God do that? Before the beginning of time. In Ephesians 1, it says, Praise be to the Lord, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So the first step in a marriage is the parent chooses 
a bride for his son. The second step is the engagement, the bride's consent. And when we look at Isaac having a wife, we, we find that that he sent his servant to pick the wife from his tribe and he asked her, do you want to come with me? And she said, yes, even though her family wanted her to stay for 10 days to say their goodbyes, but she left with him. Now, in Jewish customs, the, hus the husband-to-be would offer the bride a glass of wine and if she drinks it he says this is like my blood and now that you drink it I have your approval to be my wife and we look at in 2nd Corinthians and in 2nd Corinthians the Apostle Paul says I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure version to him. So that is the second stage. The third stage is the wedding itself. In John 14, 3, Jesus says, I am going to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. We accepted Jesus in our life before we even met him. And we are waiting for him for the wedding to take place when Jesus comes to take us with him. The first wedding or marriage I will talk about is the marriage at Cana. We see that it says in John 2, 1, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. The third day, we look at that word and we look at a forward view. Because one day is like a thousand days to God. In Second Peter 3, 8, it says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord's with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So if we look at us being in the year 2024, and if every thousand years resembles a day, we finish day one, we finish day two, and now we are in day three, expecting Jesus' coming back. And we see that for that wedding, that Jesus was invited. Jesus did not just go to the wedding. And Jesus does not push his way through. You have to call him. He needs to be invited. He is not pushy. He would not have gone to the wedding at Cana if he was not invited. And that's why we have to invite Jesus to our life when we want him to dwell in us. When we see people that invited Jesus in their heart and their lives, they are filled with joy and peace. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. 
In Luke 19, we look at Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. I must stay with you in your house today. And in verse 6, it says about Zacchaeus, he came down from the tree at once and welcomed him gladly. In Acts 16, 34, the Bible says that the Philippi jailer was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When we continue reading about the wedding in Cana, in, in, we find out that it says when the wine was gone, and that is a big problem. When the wine is gone in a wedding and the wedding is still going on. At Cana of Galilee, when the earthly celebration was over, the wine gone is a description of man who did not experience salvation. Jesus had the solution. His presence at that wedding was of special importance. We find that Jesus himself blessed that first wedding. Jesus had blessed a wedding before that, Adam and Eve's unity in the beginning of creation. And the presence of God in any marriage, and every marriage is very important. When there is a marriage with the Lord missing, it cannot be a happy marriage and it ends up with divorce. These days, when people want to get married, they start thinking about the party the celebration, the wedding party itself. They wanna, who they're gonna hire to sing, or if they're gonna go away to Vegas, and people go to Vegas and they're happy because it's uh, quick and they go, uh, it's like a drive through. It's a marriage where you can dri just drive through and get a marriage certificate. Where is the Lord? The Lord is not in this marriage. So in Vegas, the two wanting to get married, just go drive through and get the certificate. And this is ignorance because that's not what a true marriage is like. And then it continues to say, when Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine, Jesus answered, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Jesus was telling his mother that he acts according to God's plan and God's timing. And his timing has not come yet. And then we listen to what Mary, the mother of Jesus, said. She did not look at Jesus. She looked at the servants and she said to them, do whatever he tells you. These words are very important. We all learn from those words that we need to do whatever Jesus tells us. No questions asked. Nearby stood six stone water jars. And those water jars, they were the kinds used by the Jews for ceremonial washings. And Jesus said, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them 
Now draw some out and take to the master of the banquet. The six jars resemble us, human beings. Six is man's number because God created man on the sixth day. The empty jars are like a person where Jesus does not live in that jar. It's empty. So Jesus did the miracle as God. The six jars or the empty jars resemble people that don't have the Lord in them. The servants resemble the believers, you and me who serve the Lord. And they evangelize and talk to people about Jesus. The servants put the water in the empty jars. Just as we should fill people with God's word and give the, them the joy and comfort. Words anointed by the Holy Spirit. Water is also a cleansing agent. Jesus washed his church with water. Ephesians 5.26 says, Jesus loved his church, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. So water cleans because water resembles the word of God. And we see Jesus throughout his life. Whatever men or people could do, he let people do. But what God needed to do, he had to do. So God wants to use us. He wants to use his servants just as they filled the jars with water. He wants us to serve him and tell people about him. But the miracle itself belonged to Jesus. When we look at Ephesians 1.13, we find that people always that received Jesus were filled with joy. It says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When do we receive the Holy Spirit? When we believe. Because when we believe, we get marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. As believers, we should be full of the Holy Spirit, full with God's word. Why? So that there is no room for the world or for sin to come in. We need to be full to the brim with the Holy Spirit and God's word. The second thing, the reason those containers were filled to the brim, those jars, because God is generous. He fills to the brim when he fills. And when he fed the crowds, they had to carry leftovers in baskets. And when we look at Psalm 23, the psalmist says, my cup overflows. We serve a generous God. Then we look at verse 11 in John 2. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. There is a difference between a sign and a miracle. 
A sign means a symbol that contains a miracle that has very deep roots. The roots here were to show the divinity of Christ. And that's why it says where he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. We also see in this sign that the age of the law is finished and a new age, the age of grace had started when Jesus comes we have joy and the age of grace starts with the water changed to wine when we look at the Old Testament Moses turned water into blood this is a symbol of condemnation because we were under the law but then the New Testament Jesus turns the water into wine which is the age of grace and the wine is a symbol of joy we see the wedding at Cana a beautiful celebration and we see people gathering together and sometimes I read this and I say I wish I was there but there is another marriage another celebration that I will be in the marriage of the supper of the lamb and I'm not going to attend it like the marriage of Cana I am going to be the bride of Christ because I am part of his church when we look at Revelations 19 9 it says right blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. So if God says blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, how much more blessed will the bride be? We, the bride of Christ. In verse 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. We see what awaits us, what awaits the real believer that is going to be raptured before the great tribulation. When the rapture happens, the believers stand in front of Christ to receive their rewards according to how they served the Lord. And we see that the crowds in heaven are saying, let's rejoice and praise God forever and ever. The most joy in this marriage of the Lamb is being with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the name of the wedding is the wedding of the Lamb, not the wedding of the bride because Jesus sacrificed himself as a lamb of sacrifice for us. He paid a great price. And then we can celebrate in that supper and in that celebration as the bride of Christ. In a heavenly marriage, now how do we prepare for that wedding how do we prepare ourselves the first thing I want you to remember this whole marriage God himself has made possible we did not have a part of it 
because it's his grace. In Colossians 1.12, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. God chose us before creation. It's all about his grace. The second thing, what the believer is doing here on earth, the believer is to announce God's word, to evangelize, to testify for Jesus, to wake those who are asleep, to preach, to teach God's word. And when souls for Christ, and when we do this, there is a reward in heaven for us. And that's why Jesus gives us to dress in clean white robes of righteousness. So there are four things in that wedding. There is Christ, Jesus himself, who inherited everything, and we get to invest, to inherit with him. Number two, the bride, his church, us, we were dead in sin, but God had compassion on us and saved us. He knew we needed a savior. Number three, we have a wedding supper. We don't look at the menu because it's not about material matters. The supper is a fill of Christ, complete fill of him who saved us. The fourth thing is who are those guests who are invited? Those guests are the believers of the Old Testament. At the end, I want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready for that marriage of the Lamb? Are you ready as the church dressed in fine linen, bright and clean, without a blemish, washed in the blood of Christ? My advice to everyone who is listening, stop listening to the news and stop worrying about all the bad news of war and all the bad things. Fill yourself with the good news of the Bible. We went on our trip and we met people that wake up in the morning on the news and go to bed listening to the news. I thank God who gave me the courage to tell them listening to the, the news on earth here will take you to hell. The good news is in God's word, in the Bible. Focus on the good news. Fill your homes with Jesus. Fill your homes and your life with God's promises and his word. We ask God to open our eyes and have us focus on his word so that we are blessed and that we would be the perfect bride for Christ. Amen.